Like, and usually I talk loudly enough people can hear. Okay, but it doesn't help for integrity. So just Larry Rubenstein, who was my junior faculty, went ahead and he did a comprehensive geriatric assessment at the Sepulveda VA. And what he showed is that basically he could decrease mortality if you did a geriatric assessment and then you did something about the outcome. Very important, if you don't do anything about the outcomes, you don't get an outcome. It's no use assessing without doing something. So they had lower mortality, they were less likely to go to nursing home and less likely to spend any time in nursing home. Subsequent to Larry's original study, many people all around the world have done geriatric assessments and what they show is that you will improve function and decrease mortality if you do it properly along with doing something. One of the big studies that was done around the world, uh, around the United States, was done out of Duke by Harvey Cohen and Harvey carefully chose people who knew nothing about geriatrics and basically told them to do this. And surprisingly, though it got published in the New England Journal, is if you know nothing about geriatrics, you take money and you put a little place there and you say, this is my assessment program, and you do absolutely nothing when you get the results. Fundamentally, the outcome is pretty horrible. I mean, you know, if you were an oncologist and a patient came to you and you found that they had cancer, and you said, well, you've got cancer, please go away and leave me alone, well, then you'd have a better outcome, as I'll show you towards the end. But for most other people, it doesn't work that way. Okay, so let's look at this. And this is just showing you that um, uh, the nursing home admissions go down as well. There's surprisingly little good data on geriatric assessment study properly in an outpatient. This is from David Rubin and his colleagues at UCLA, where they showed if they did it in a... Uh, large group health practice, physical functioning between the treatment and control groups was significantly better if you did the treatment. They also improved uh, quality of life and restrictive activity days, and this cost $273 per participant, which is a pretty good outcome under those circumstances. So what I'm going to tell you about today is this rapid geriatric assessment, and this is it. This is all you need to know. And there are four components. One is to assess frailty. One is to assess sarcopenia. One is to assess whether or not the person is anorectic. And the last one is to see, are they thinking well? And there are a couple of other questions you always have to ask older people. You want to know, are they incontinent and are they constipated? Because those are two major problems. Uh, most of the reason you want to know if they've got urinary incontinence is to take them off the drugs the urologists have put them on because they all cause uh, problems with cognition. So that's a fairly straightforward one. Um, constipation, you want to know that so you can take them off the colates that somehow every physician that SLU seems to think does something has never been shown to do something. There are drugs that work, you know. The... Uh, laxatives that are uh, bulking, uh, the uh, Miralax, the Sorbitol, lact uh, Lactulose all work pretty well. Colase does not work, so please don't put people on a drug that doesn't work. Harrison says that you should do that for cardiology after myocardial infarction. That explains to you why cardiologists know so little, okay? And no one would ever put that in a, a thing if you basically read the literature. Reading is a big piece of the problem we most of us have. And then the last thing, which I'll talk about at the end, is the advanced directive. And the other reason for doing that is, as of September, Medicare is going to pay for an advanced directive uh, discussion. So what you do here is you find out in this visit that they haven't had, an, they don't have an advanced directive. Then you bring them back for another visit, and you'll get paid more for it. So this is basically, and I think it's worthwhile doing. So I'll show you why. So why do we want to do these things in older people? So let's start with frailty. Frailty occurs when under stressful conditions the person has diminished ability to carry out important practical social activities of daily living. It needs to be distinguished from disability. What we're trying to do now in geriatrics is say people are going to get disabled. Once they're disabled, taking them from disabled back to being able is very difficult. These are the people who finish up in nursing home or finish up stuck at home and do poorly. What you want to do is catch this early 
do the things that you can do to stop them becoming disabled. And that's really the key to what everybody wants to do, no matter what condition you're treating. When people finish up in a nursing home, that is a poor outcome. I love nursing homes, I love working in nursing homes, but I don't think any of you here would like to spend the rest of your life in a nursing home unless you were working in it, which I happen to enjoy, and most people don't even want to work in them, so that's how it is. By the way, Renoir there shows what you can do he had rheumatoid arthritis, and fundamentally, his hands were such that he could not hold a paintbrush. He overcame the problem painting, holding the paintbrush like this. That is phenomenal. That is uh, yeah, the Ronda de la Rosa. He painted like that. And if any of you can paint as well as that with your hand just normal, you would be a really famous artist. So recognize that you can overcome disability once you've got it, but it's better to stop you getting there. So this is just pointing out that all the residents in the audience who are here are somewhere up here mostly, so they're still getting better. And that doesn't matter whether we're talking about how much you can remember, your VO2 max, cardiac output, balance, or muscle strength. Once you reach 30, you start to go downhill. So all the faculty are going downhill. That's important for the residents to remember, the students. And they go down at the rate of 1% per year over your whole lifetime. And that's roughly what's going to happen to you. So you have to recognize that. So the better you are at 30, the better you will be when you get out here at 80. The disease tends to always make people get to frailty earlier, and the only thing that really seems to make a big difference, so we'll show you some dietary things as well, is exercise. And those are the two things that can make a difference. So frailty, when we look at it, there's a frailty cascade, and it consists of psycho psychological things, social things, and biological things. So people who are depressed can't think, anxious, fear, falling, are fatigued, and uh, they think that they're going to do poorly, do poorly. So that is one group of people who are very frail, and if you pick those up, you can change something. Social, we're not going to change the social situation, though some of what we hope will come out of this grant is that we will show in Ferguson and some of the other places that frailty is occurring there as we've already shown in the inner city in St. Louis. It occurs there because the environment is pathetic. If you have a street and you go out into the street and you can't walk on the street, your chances of having bad diabetes and poor control go up about 100%. And we showed that in the inner city uh, study with Doug Miller. So you have to recognize that environment is extraordinarily important, and that includes your support system as well. And then biological, which is what we're concentrating on mostly, some of it is genetic. If you happen to have a funny ACE gene, you're going to have weak muscles when you get old. If you've got a funny myostatin gene, you're going to have weak muscles when you get old. So there are some things that we cannot do much about. But the rest of it is muscles, hormones, cytokines, and then disease and deficits that we develop, and we can do something about all of that. All of these come together to give you frailty. People who are frail go on to develop functional deficits if you don't do anything about it, and then they develop more likely to go to hospital, they're more likely to finish up in a nursing home, and in the end, they're more likely to die. So this is the first of the screens. This is frail, and this is the basis of the screen. It's very simple. It takes under 15 seconds to do. It's frail. Are you fatigued? Can you climb a flight of stairs, walk one block, more than five illnesses or loss of weight? If you score two or less, your pre-fail, zero is great, but one or two, your pre-fail, we need to pay attention to that, but if it's three or more, you are now frail, and this works very well. The reason, by the way, the illnesses are there is not so that somebody will rush in and treat the illnesses. It's what we found is if you have more than five illnesses, you have an excess number of drugs. Remember, when you hit five drugs, the next drug I give you it gives you a 25% chance of getting better, but also a 25% chance of getting a side effect that will kill you. So any drugs over five that your patients have over the age of 65, you need to say, do they really need it? 
Is that statin really saving them? And the answer is by about 70 to 75 clearly isn't, okay? Remember that the statin data shows that you decrease, uh, you improve mortality by 1% over 18 years, and if I'm 75, I add 18 years to that, that means I have a 1 in 100 chance of not having died by the time I'm 90-something. Most of us are going to have died by the time we're 90-something, so treating cholesterol at that age predominantly really stupid, and I, I, I should stop saying this, but I've realized that physicians are amazingly stupid, starting with me, I, and we do things that people tell us to do without asking why. And, you know, yes, if I'm 50 and I've got risk factors, I would like to take that 1% decrease in mortality. But when I'm 75, what am I saving? You know, I've got to think about this. Now, somebody's going to live to 120. I understand that. And if you're one of those people with those genes, maybe taking a statin will let you get to 121. Uh, very useful outcome. Okay. So think about these things and think about whether the medicines are useful. The other thing, I did grand rounds at the end of last year on overtreatment of high blood pressure. As you all hopefully remember from that, that anything below 160, there is no data in people over the age of 60 that treating that blood pressure makes any difference at all to the outcome. That doesn't mean that we don't all treat people, that the cardiologists and nephrologists don't tell you to treat people down to 140. There's just no data. And without data, and the little data that exists actually says that you get into trouble. So that's why we care about illnesses. And this, by the way, has now been validated in by a, in t at least 10, play, uh, con, uh, uh, 10 validations in the United States, Australia, Hong Kong, uh, 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 China, which I don't have up there, uh, uh, Europe, and Turkey. So it's been validated all over the world in all the continents except Africa. People don't, on the whole, get that old in Africa. Um, so one or two pre-fail, three or more is frail. This is the validation here in our African-American population. These are people 50 to 65. So while we're talking about doing this in the Medicare population, these work well in a younger population as well. And what we're showing you here is compared to the very complex frailty scales that have been developed that take 15 to 30 minutes to do, the simple frail scale looks just as good. So you can spend 30 minutes trying to work out if somebody's frail, or you can do it in... 15 seconds. You can take your choice, and here we're just showing you that the specificity uh, is, uh, is as good for all of them. Uh, there are always problems with sensitivity with some of these things. So the second part of this uh, rapid geriatric screen is sarcopenia, and we have something called the SARC-F. The SARC-F looks at strength, how much difficulty do you have in lifting or carrying 10 pounds, and they're all none, some, or a lot. How much difficulty do you have walking across uh, a room? How much difficulty do you have uh, transferring from a chair to a bed? How much difficulty do you have climbing a flight of uh, 10 stairs? And how many times have you fallen in the last year? These are actually go back, when you go back to the frailty questionnaire, these are actually the R and the A in the frailty questionnaire. But in fact, there are people who have sarcopenia who are not coming up on the frailty scale. So we look separately for sarcopenia as something we can pick up very early. Um, if your score is greater than four, you're going to get into trouble. So the SARC-F, like I showed you with the frail, has been uh, looked at all over the world. This has been done by the people in Chengdu, so I thought I'd start with the panda bears. And no, we're not looking at frailty in panda bears. These are humans in Chengdu, okay? And Li Chao, who's actually in the audience together with Professor Barong Dong, did this study. And what they showed is that the SARC-F is highly predictive of poor outcomes. Again, in our study, we showed that the SARC-F predicts ADLs, IADLs, hospitalization, gait speed, and mortality. Together with the people in uh, Baltimore, Ted Molstrom here and Luigi Ferrucci actually went ahead and showed in the Baltimore Longitudinal Study. It's highly predictive of disability down the line, and it's also predictive of mortality. 
This is a study done by Jean Wu uh, in Hong Kong, and she again compared it to the much more complex ways of looking at it. So here you see all the different def definitions, the foundation of the NIH, the European definition for sarcopenia, the international working group's definition, the Asian working group, and when you look at it, it turns out that the SARC F is slightly more predictive in most cases of outcomes than any of these much more complex tests that now you have to get a bone, uh, a, a bone mineral density to look at the muscle mass, they're expensive. The simple test works about as well. So it's reasonable. And this is just to point out we're using diabetes, but I could do exactly the same thing with heart failure, cancer, or anything else that it is also highly predictive of poor outcomes in people with chronic disease at any age. And here we're looking and showing you the outcomes with uh, the sarc -F. So when I put this together for the grant, we did not have the simplified nutrition assessment questionnaire. When I was trying to put it together, I realized that weight loss is a big piece of frailty. And the problem is when people have lost weight, remember, over the age of 60, a person who loses weight is going to die. It doesn't matter whether they've got diabetes and you think weight loss is good for them or you think they're just too fat, they die. There is not good things about losing weight when you're older. Part of that reason is when you lose weight, you lose muscle and you lose bone. Exercise does not protect the bone. Exercise will protect the muscle. If you lose bone, eventually you're going to fracture your hip. People who fracture their hip, 20 to 30 percent are dead within the first year. So that alone is part of the bad reason. I think if you want to lose weight over 60, you've got to do it with exercise. You can't afford to do it with caloric restriction. And anybody who tells a diabetic age 65 to calorically restrict is trying to kill them. And we're not in the business of murdering people, I hope. None of you are, okay? So we should stop and think what the literature says. And you can say, well, that's wrong, and it isn't the case, and I know that if I take somebody who's got a BMI of 45, age 65, they'll do better. And that may be true if their BMI is 45, but it's not true if their BMI is 35. Point out to the cardiologists who are not here that all the cardiology literature shows that the optimal BMI for stage 4 heart failure is... Somebody help me, 35. Okay, if you want to survive with stage 4 heart failure, you want to be fat as anything. Okay, 35, and there are like seven studies that show this. Uh, cardiologists don't usually talk about that. I don't know why, but it's how life is. Okay, so we want to stop weight loss, and that means we want to pick people up who are getting anorexia. As you get older, you get an anorexia of aging, and it's really important to be able to look at that and be aware of it. And this has been shown first here, and I'll show you very rapidly in Japan and in France now. That's very simple. My appetite is very poor, very good. When I eat, I feel full after a few bites or hardly ever. Food tastes very bad, very good. Normally, I eat less than one full meal a day, multiple meals. This is highly predictive of weight loss six months later. We showed it at our outpatient clinics here. We've shown it in the nursing home. They've shown it in Japan and all over the place. It's got very good receiver operating uh, curves, good sensitivity and specificity. Here's the Japanese study showing the same thing. Uh, they didn't, they did looked at something slightly different in France, but they showed that compared to the much more com complex mini nutritional assessment, it works as well, if not better. Now, we've done these three things. It's no use doing them. Remember, I told you up front that comprehensive geriatric assessment only works if you manage the patient. Now, I realize that physicians are busy and they have no time to manage geriatric problems because they actually usually take time. So what we've developed is an algorithm, and all of this is going to be in all of our, your computers. It's going to be there in the electronic health record, and you'll be able to click on a single button which will say, if the patient said they were fatigued, then you will go and do the uh, George Grossberg slu am sad to look for depression, and if they're depressed, you treat the depression. Uh, uh, do you have uh, trouble, uh, stop breathing while asleep? You usually ask the family members, you send them to Ray Bury to fix their sleep apnea. You don't have to do any work here. It will have a consult automatically to poor Ray, who will get more than he's ever wanted to see. I've been trying to make you Ray stop telling us all that everybody has sleep apnea. He's got a 
find out now they do. Okay, uh, you get a TSH for hypothyroidism, you look at vitamin B12, you uh, get a hemoglobin for anemia, and you get a blood pressure standing because a lot of people have hypertension because of overtreatment, and particularly when they stand up. And if you do those things, you pick up about 80% of the causes of fatigue. There are another 20% that are very difficult to diagnose, but at least this is a start. The sarcopenia, you want to do resistance and aerobic exercise. You want to uh, about, about three times a week, and I'll talk about the dose there is important. This is not walking 20 minutes. It may help a little bit, but if you really want to fix people with disease, the dose has to be intensive. So this is a time where you do resistance exercises. Uh, you also want a pub protein suppl supplement and a 1,000 international units of vitamin D a day. Uh, illnesses, I've told you what to do, get rid of drugs and people will get better. And remember, anticholinergic drugs, many drugs are anticholinergic. So if I'm treating the incontinence in an older person, I am actually making them less functional because anticholinergics do not do well. We give people colon and energic enhancing agents like Aricept that hardly work to try and improve their memory and then at the same time a patient comes to me and they're on an anticholinergic. This makes no sense. Okay, <laughs> this is giving two drugs, neither of which are going to work because they're going to cancel one another out. And then loss of weight, we have the Meals on Wheels mnemonic that's been around for 35 years now. Medications, de emotional depression, elder abuse, uh, alcoholism, late life paranoia, I think you're poisoning me, problems with swallowing, oral problems, nosocomial infections. H. pylori without GERD is a common reason for weight loss in our older population. Always look for it, wandering and other dementia related problems, the endocrine things, hypothyroidism, hypercalcemia, hyperglycemia, hy hyperadrenalism, uh, 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 Addison's disease, enteral problems, celiac disease is very common in older people. If you look for it, you'll be surprised how often you find it. Eating problems, if you can't get the food to your mouth, you're going to lose weight. And then there's this wonderful thing called therapeutic diets. There is no data that these therapeutic diets work. And the most recent data shows that salt, low salt, kills you. The data is phenomenal for low salt killing. Everything the CDC tells us to do about salt, if you do it, it will kill you. So we know that the CDC is worried because they can't afford the Social Security. They've got to pay for me, and they want to get rid of old, old people. That's the only reason to do these low salt diets. They don't work. And I mean, realistically, the data is amazingly good. I talked about that in my hypertension grand round. So if you weren't there, you're going to have to go read it up yourself. And then stones, cholecystitis are things to look at. This is just showing you George Grossberg's very quick, brief geriatric depression scale that you use if, you put, if they fit into those groups. It's important to pay attention to depression, but it's a secondary screen. We'll show you the same thing for cognitive dysfunction. You don't need to screen first because you're going to pick it up with the other things. Fatigue does a wonderful thing and anorexia picks it up to start with. So what about cognitive dysfunction? So, we know that all of you know whether your patient can think or not. So basically the data we've got in the clinics here is that the pickup is about 10%. So 90% of people with dementia are not diagnosed by their primary care physician when you're an internist. The same is true at UCLA, and I'm hoping it's a lot better because the slums is available and I hope people are using it. But if you're not using some sort of formal way to look for dementia, you miss it all the time. And in family practitioners, basically, they miss 25%. So family practitioners tend to know their patients better and most probably talk to the family members more, but uh, internists are terrible at picking up uh, cognitive dysfunction. And by the way, subspecialists just don't do it, so we don't even need to worry there. <laughs> okay, so the original way to do this was started by this guy, Falstein. He did something called the mini mental status. It's an okay example. Exam. It doesn't pick up early cognitive problems. It only picks them up once you've got dementia. It's educationally dependent. Um, doctors do terribly on this. He was a physician, and if you're a physician, I'll pick you up immediately with this. You can't do this when you start getting demented as a physician. On the other hand, if you're an accountant, you can keep on doing this till you're totally demented. So you just got to recognize there are differences, and it doesn't test for vicious spatial, which is a very important part of early dementia. So we compared 
basically the slums, the St. Louis University mental status exam, to the mini mental status. And it turns out that for MCI, the receiver operating curves are so much better that it's ridiculous, okay? Uh, this is the slums for those of you who haven't seen it, and I won't spend any time on it because I'm going to show you can do this much quicker. And then the Montreal Cognitive Assessment, Slums take six and a half minutes. This one takes about 10 to 12 minutes to do. Uh, the mini mental status takes 10 minutes. So if you're only interested in time, the slums is still better than the other. When we compare the tests, we got rid of the mini mental status. The marker and the slums do about as well in both sensitivity and specificity. But the problem is no busy physician has six and a half minutes to do a mental test. I mean, I'm sorry, you know, you, maybe some internist, but certainly no family practitioner, no person who's seeing people every 10 or 15 minutes. So we said, well, how can we cut it down? And what we did is we finished up coming out with the, look, looked at the data and it said, if you can do the five words, if you can get the clock right, and if in that sentence where it says the person lives in Chicago and you can tell me they live in Illinois, you do not have problems. And I can pick up early problems if you fail on those things. And I pick up the executive function, the bottom question. I pick up visual spatial and I pick up the people who've got amnestic disease, which means that they're going to go on to get Alzheimer's disease. So I can pick them all up very quickly. And this takes basically two and a half to three minutes to do. So we've now got it down to the lowest I think we're ever going to get, and we showed that it works better both for dementia and also for uh, uh, M uh, MCI compared to the mini-cog which was available. This is showing you our endocrine diabetic clinic. This was done by a medical student over the summer, and he did the rapid cognitive screen. And the point I want to make is the 50 to 59-year-olds. 20% of them basically are not thinking well. If you're not thinking well, you come to see an endocrinologist. And I tell you that you've got to prick your finger, you've got to adjust your insulin, you've got to do this, you've got to do that, and I want you to take these 15 different drugs, including your statin and stuff, and you've got to take them at different times of the day and don't take your calcium with any of the others, and I send you home. If you can't think, how much of this do you think you remember? And then... The endocrine faculty says, we get all these bad patients who nobody can fix. It's true. Bad patients you can't fix, can't think. If you can't think, you've got to have somebody helping them or it's not going to work. Same for cancer, same for people with liver disease, same for ca uh, cardiac disease. These figures are about universal. So if you've got a complex disease and you don't look to see if the person can't think, please don't treat them. You're more likely to kill them and help them because they'll take the drugs wrong. And I see this all the time in my geriatric practice because they come to me, the family brings them and say, I can't get them to take their drugs properly and they're dropping their blood pressure because, you know, they don't take the drug. They take three one day and none the next day. You know, if you don't think, you don't do these things well. You need help with your medicines as a minimum if you're going to do it. I want to point out that there are many reversible causes of MCI, which is one of the reasons you want to make the diagnosis. I did this in a Grand Rounds last year, but it's drugs, emotional depression, metabolic hypothyroidism. If you can't see in here, that's most probably the most common reason for MCI. And if I get your eyes fixed, I get your hearing aids, you suddenly do better and you don't go on to get dementia, by the way. The people who don't get it fixed, if I can't see in here, eventually I stop functioning and I become demented. Normal pressure hydrocephalus, these are the, the wild, uh, the wacky, wobbly, and wet. Tumor or other space occupying lesions. Infection, syphilis, chronic infections. Anemia, vitamin B12, and alcoholism. And for a sleep apnea. These are the major causes. Sleep apnea is most probably the major cause of mild cognitive impairment. So you've got to think about these. I know nobody likes mnemonics, so. As always, I like to show you the presidents of the United States, and here's Coolidge. His son basically uh, died when he was in office. He took to bed, depressed, spent six months in bed, and his wife ran the country. Uh, wait till Donald Trump runs the country. Who knows what will run it at that stage? Uh, Kennedy, you all know that he basically had adrenal disease. He told Khrushchev, I don't mind if you blow up a third of the United States, I'd prefer that than you put missiles in Cuba. Whether he was right or wrong, it was a stupid decision. 
to not worry about losing a third of the United States. This is what generals do. Okay, that's why you become a general, so you can go and blow things up. I mean, you know, we get so worried about people blowing things up. We all do it. You should do it. So he just wasn't taking his steroids. If he'd been taking his steroids, he would have looked for a less dangerous way. But generals become heroes because they get away with doing really stupid things. They make physicians look really bright. That's one of the nice things. Okay, Ronald Reagan, you all know that uh, if you're a Democrat, he fell off his horse the day before he started his presidency. If you're a Republican, he did it the day after he finished it. It doesn't matter. He got bilateral subdurals, which were basically had delirium through a piece, most probably, uh, at the end of his uh, presidency, and that was his early Alzheimer's. Here we have Coolidge who uh, basically, in my version and the one I can document in the history, had bleeding hemorrhoids when he negotiated with Khrushchev to give away half of Europe, and that's why we got a Berlin Wall and all the other things, uh, so anemia. Here we have George Bush. I remember, you know, George Bush used to drink a lot when he was young. Every, nobody argues about that. And I remember when he was running for president, he promised me that the only thing that mattered was he was going to lower my taxes to nothing and spend unending money on the army, both of which he did, by the way. And you remember the outcome in the end. So if you think about this, this is confabulation. Korsakoff syndrome. Okay, <laughs> nobody else could look at it this in any other way. So just as long as you understand what happened and at least stop the people with Korsakoff's drinking. They get worse if they continue drinking. And then, of course, we have that young man there who clearly is going to finish up with this. And when his <laughs> wife is president, he'll have so much spare time. I hate to think what will happen to him. Uh, so <laughs> we better find somebody else for the Democrats to protect him. Okay. And then finally up there is Taft, who had sleep apnea. Okay, so we cover the... Uh, uh, the reason for doing this is people don't pay attention to the early mild cognitive impairment. And if you wait too long, you can't reverse these things. If you reverse it early, it makes a big difference. The other things that work is epidemiologically, a Mediterranean diet really works well. And in fact, there's one now trial where they went ahead and they did the Mediterranean diet. They did it with nuts and olive oil. The amount of olive oil you need to take is one liter a week. Have you all got that? It's a lot of olive oil. All of you will get diarrhea. If you live in Spain, you don't. So all the Spaniards laugh at me when I say you can't do this. They tell me how to do it. They put olive oil on all the bad pasta. You can make bad pasta taste wonderful with olive oil. Uh, you can basically have bread dunked in olive oil. You'll put on weight, but you'll live longer and you will actually have less heart disease, less frailty, and you'll think better. Uh, in addition to that, by the way, there is an olive oil martini. So you can have your vodka martinis with olive oil. It tastes terrible, but <laughs> you know, I tell my patients, if you're desperate, that's the other way to get it in. So, exercise. So m some of you may, most probably none of the residents, because I can't convince them to read JAMA and New England Journal every week, or at least look at the abstracts, but the rest of you most probably looked at JAMA and realized that this week the life study said that fundamentally you don't improve memory if you basically exercise. The problem is the exercise was so little that wasn't exercise. And they're right. They're, all the data shows and the literature is so mixed up because low exercise intensity does nothing for memory. It's got to be high exercise intensity, usually resistance exercise. And if you do that, it seems to work in almost all the studies. If you don't do that, it doesn't work. Uh, so the question is, if you put all of this together, if you have exercise, a Mediterranean diet, you get people to play computerized games, you socialize, get them to do some socialization. Can you make a difference to your patients? And the answer comes from the finger study, which is the Finnish geriatric study, where they showed that if you do this, you actually do an incredible job in people who are old stopping the memory decline. So for people who are young, you want to do the same things because your memory decline has started. Remember, you've peaked at 30. So after 30, if you're not doing these things, you're going down a little quicker. So you should be doing it for yourselves. But this is what you need to tell your patients, that a combination of fruit and vegetables, olive oil, exercise, and computer games will actually slow down your memory deficit, and it will do it whether you've got dementia or not. 
it improves cognition. So this is the, um, and I apologize for the slide, I know it's a lousy slide to read, but this is the uh, Brain Health uh, Inter uh, uh, International Association of Gerontology and Geriatrics coming out in September. John Morris and I chaired this. This is what you're supposed to do if you pick up people who have early problems. You've got to basically spend some time with them, unfortunately, uh, explaining what's going on. Uh, you need to identify all potentially reversible problems. We've just talked about the things that you should do. We'll talk a little bit about cognition stimulation, which works really well for moderate dementia. And our medical students are going to have groups here uh, starting in the, uh, the summer, uh, uh, or at least in the winter. Uh, you've got to discuss potential uh, 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 the use of cholinesterase inhibitors in people with dementia. That's John Morris. I don't do it. Okay, you've, I just don't think it's cost effective, but some people do. Encourage the person uh, uh, to develop uh, advanced directives, obviously. Educate the patient and the family. Send them to the Alzheimer's Association. They'll do all the education for you. Um, basically, you've got to start saying, what is safe? Driving. You can't drive if you're demented. So if for no other reason you want to know your patients are demented, get them off the roads before they kill you when you're going home. Uh, make sure that you basically do other safety things, which is basically get guns and power tools out of the house. People shoot one another when they're demented. I had a patient, uh, my son actually, who was a policeman, was called me because fundamentally he'd gone to see someone who's standing in the house. There's this woman dead. He shot her, and he's saying, when is Mildred coming home? His wife came back. He thought she was an intruder. She shot him. He shot her. My favorite patient was a 93-year-old who fundamentally thought his, her daughter, age 70, was dating the wrong guy. So she took a shotgun out to shoot him. Fortunately, she shot off her toe, which was a better outcome. But, you know, you really have to recognize that you can't let people who are dangerous, NRA or not, I don't care if you want to support guns, don't give it to demented people. They really are dangerous. You know, Charlton Heston had dementia and he kept his guns. I mean, the fact... The worst thing that happened to America was he didn't kill somebody under those circumstances because that would have solved the MRA problem. Maybe they would have realized that demented people shouldn't carry uh, 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 guns. And then try and encourage people to go into research studies because that's the only way we get anywhere. Uh, in a couple of seconds, I just want to point out, this is the cognitive stimulation therapy programs. It's called Making a Difference. It comes out of England. Uh, we've done it in our nursing home. Um, Marla Bergweg and the social work people have set this up and they have training going. In Perry County, the hospital offers this to anybody who's demented. So Perry County can do it, but we don't offer it. So our students are going to be doing it. It's the only way I can find. And if you've got an occupational therapist, speech therapist, they can actually get it. It's more cost effective than Aricept and produces slightly better outcomes. With the Alzheimer's Association, we've developed the Cardinals Reminiscence League. It also works. It's another way that you can actually get your patients who've got moderate dementia involved and doing well. So management of cognitive dysfunction, get rid of our anticholinergic drugs, treat depression, check they're not hypothyroid or B12 deficiency, get the hearing and visual problems fixed, atrial fibrillation. Haven't mentioned that Im amazingly important. This is why people who are falling and old need to be actually on some form of anticoagulation. Don't worry that they will fall and bleed in their head because they will continue to fall with atrial fibrillation. It's one of the major causes of falling in older people, uh, shown by Mike Rich up the road and watch you. And in second to that, your rate of deterioration as far as your dementia is huge. So it's not acceptable to say, I put the person on an aspirin, or I didn't put them on a drug because they're falling. You're not treating something that's treatable, and then you send the rest to Ray and pulmonology for sleep apnea. And then the Mediterranean diet, olive oil, exercise, computer games, socialization, cognition stimulation therapy, refer to the Alzheimer's Association, Association safe return basic, the scuffs, driving, and gun. And you'll say, well, we can't do this. What I'm telling you to do is too much. Jean Wu, who's my friend in Hong Kong, went ahead and screened 800 people at a, in a senior center, and she did this in three weeks. So it takes no time to do. It's easy to do. We're going to be developing screening programs with the students, and you'll see that what will happen is the patients will come in 
with a piece of paper asking you why you haven't done the things I'm telling you to do. I believe that there are two ways to get physicians to do things. One is pay them. I've shown you you can get well paid. And if I don't pay you, the best thing is to make the patients come and ask you why you're not doing it. Then you start to do it. So there are two ways to get there. And she showed that there's overlap between these different things, but you need to do all of them. And this is, again, showing the diabetic clinic these are 50 to 60 year olds, the only ones I bother about here. And there, for each of them, about 20% of 50 to 60 year olds have frailty, sarcopenia, and or cognitive dysfunction. You've got to look in your sick patients as well. The information sheets are available for older persons who screen positive. All of this is going to be in the electronic health record. So we're trying to make it really easy for you guys. And they are basically, this is a frailty one, and it tells you what you should ask your doctor about, polypharmacy, vitamin D, um, and it also says there, here are the resistance exercises taken from the CDC outcome. Here's the brain health one. It tells the patients what to do, but it tells you to talk to your physician about some of the things like sleep apnea. Sarcopenia, same sort of thing. More exercises for the sarcopenic patient. So when you put this together, you're going to be able to get this plug it into your wellness exam, collect your $177, which is very nice for having somebody, and we think this is going to be done in the end by the technician who puts the person into the room. So it will all be there, all you've got to do is look at it. So in the last few minutes, I need to talk about the last piece of the screening, because, you know, we live in America, and this is about it. Thank you for not dying. Nobody in the United States thinks they should die. I mean, we know that somebody will save everybody in the United States and all the money is spent at the end of life. Now, the beauty is America started advanced directives. This was the Sioux Indian. And the Sioux Indian used to each day say to their colleague, let it be a great day to die because they knew they were going to go out and they were either going to fight wild animals or another Indian tribe, and many of them were going to die, and they were teaching one another to accept that death is not a bad outcome. Now, it wasn't a great outcome for the Sioux Indians. A little bit like Kennedy, they were being a little stupid fighting, but, you know, people like to do these things, I understand that. But that's what Advanced Directs is about. It's helping people have a great day to die. There is nothing better than being with a patient when they die, when they, you've done the right things, they're not in pain, and they've accepted death. Not easy to get there, a lot of work, but if you can get there, and our uh, palliative care people here in geriatrics do a wonderful job, as some of you know, in the hospital, trying to help people come to terms with something that's really difficult to come to terms with. So I hope you'll all have a great day to die today. Oh, not, hopefully not today. Oh, sorry about that. Okay. So this is the medical model, and this has been classically and still is mostly the model. The physician focuses on care and then says, eh, Sorry, I can't cure, cure you anymore. Uh, sorry for oncology, but this is so classical. Uh, so don't come back and see me. Go back and see somebody else. You know, I'm finished. I can't do anything. You, people don't always follow up when people are non-fixable. So then if they're really lucky, they get thrown into palliative care, and six days later they die, and the palliative care did nothing. This is what the model should be from the moment they start, and now we're uh, starting to have... Uh, 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 Dulce Cruz and others in the oncology clinic to help the oncologists realize that from the beginning you should be thinking about the, the psychosocial support, the spiritual support, but still do the disease-focused care. It's putting the two together and then transitioning when it becomes important. And the other thing is to remember that bereavement care is important. Patients really appreciate it if you go to the funeral. Not the patients, because they don't care. Or maybe they care, I don't know. But, but certainly the families get very thankful if you turn up to a funeral. The residents don't get to do that because you don't know most of the patients. But if one of your outpatients dies, try and go to the funeral. You'll be amazed how thankful people are when you turn up, even if you killed them. They actually are usually more thankful when you made a mistake. And it really drives me crazy. Sometimes I go because I'm feeling so guilty because I think I did the wrong thing. And then they all tell me how wonderful I am. And it's like, oh, you know, I didn't come to hear this. I came to say I'm sorry, you know. But 
people really appreciate it. It makes a big difference. So where you can, do that. Uh, this was, I think, originally Dr. Flaherty's patient, or the quote, this is a, uh, not her picture because we can't put a picture up, but she said, let me tell you, doctor, dying is the experience of a lifetime. And what had happened is... Dr. Flaherty got her involved with palliative care, with hospice, and none of her family were all fighting. And the families came together and stopped fighting when she was dying. So she got what she wanted. She got the things fixed. So this is the question you should always ask. What is the historic human mortality rate? And in 2000 BC, 100% of people died. And in 2020... 100% of people will die. We do not have immortality. Okay, so Tetonus had immortality, but no other human has ever had immortality. You're stuck. So nothing has changed over this period of time. This is why you should pay attention. And just remember that at the end of life, there's a marked increase in using ICUs, in using hospitals, which are horrible places. Um, five to six percent of Medicare beneficiaries who die each year use a third of Medicare dollars. That's ridiculous. Okay, if you're going to die, it's not the time to be using money. Sorry. Um, this is just showing you hospital usage again. Uh, sorry, I'm going the wrong way. Okay. Dying is costly. That's what I want you to know. Palliative care, the New England Journal uh, last week had an article on palliative care and the things that should be done. I think all of you should go read it and understand the things we don't have for people when they're dying. Uh, symptoms in advanced disease, they have all of these different things. And it doesn't matter whether you've got dementia or cancer or heart failure. Pain is very common in people with heart failure towards the end of their life. You've got to recognize we need to pay attention and treat those things. And the other thing is you've got to realize physicians are useless at saying when somebody's going to die. You know, when you say the person's going to die in a week, they usually die three years later. If you say they're going to die in three years, they die while you're telling them they're going to die. You know, we're not very good at it. And so we have to recognize that even with the best algorithms, we're not good at working out when people are going to die. So does palliative care help? So the Kaiser Permanente did this very nice study where they looked at putting in a palliative care program or they let the primary care physician look after people. And it turned out that even though they told the primary care physician that they needed to basically... Uh, do something about palliative care, there was a huge increase in satisfaction in the people in the palliative care program. It also cut costs dramatically. It costs much less when you put somebody in a palliative care program. If it wasn't making people happy, I'd say, well, you shouldn't do that. That would be the death panels of Sarah Palin. But remember, Sarah Palin sees Russia from Alaska, so her death panels are most probably also fictitious. So let's recognize, and we need to talk about that stuff, because patients here, they believe these people. I mean, how you can have a politician who says it's a death panel and we're trying to kill people, that's most probably what she would do if she got in. So if I extrapolate that, that means all Republicans want to kill us all off. Okay, uh, Given the 19-odd people who really think they should be the president on the Republican side, maybe if we killed them off, we'd have one or two really good people. Uh, but Don Trump is going to be my president. I'm voting for him and I'm excited. Okay, I'm uh, being serious about this now. University of Michigan, the CEO at, uh, at the university uh, uh, hospital said, you know, those oncologists are costing me a hell of a lot of money. And they keep people in hospital forever, and I don't think this is useful for my budget. So he got Robert Wood Johnson to give him a, a grant to hire a nurse who went around and she would say to the people, you know, the oncologists really don't know when to stop. And I think it's time you went back to your farm. And these people listened to her. So she was clearly better at convincing people what to do than the oncologist. And here you see the outcome. What he got worked beautifully. The costs went way down. So getting people to dump their oncologist saves a lot of money. Okay, number one. I'm not saying they should, but it's what happened. But the other piece is the nurse actually got people to live longer. 266 days versus 227 days. This doesn't mean we shouldn't have oncologists. This means that we have to learn when to stop. 
And learning when to stop is very hard for... I have this problem, so I understand. It's very hard to know when you should stop trying to keep a person alive and focus on palliative care. Aetna's had a compassionate care program, and all this shows is that what they've managed to do is decrease uh, ICUs. They basically had less uh, inpatient hospital days, and it really has made a difference. This is the lung cancer study showing that if you have a palliative care program early on, you again get people to live a little bit longer. So what I've tried to tell you is you will have, most probably within a month or so, in your electronic record, if our IT people can do it, which uh, we're competing here against St. Mary's for putting it in, and also against uh, Perry County. My bet is Perry County and the uh, uh, clinics in the inner city will get it in long before SLU or SM, SSM. But, you know, I'm just skeptical about what we manage to get done here. So recognize that these things can make a difference. You'll have algorithms with a order set that you can order when things happen. So what I hope I've told you is rapid geriatric assessment can be completed within about four minutes and it can be used as a major component of the Medicare wellness exam, $177 the first time, $111 the next time. Most of us don't get close to that when we see patients. Simple guide to treatment and patient handouts is going to be available and is available. The handouts at the back, by the way, are there if you want to start using it before. And Medicare will be paying for end-of-life discussions, so that's why the trigger is there for the end-of-life discussion. So with that, I will stop. The other piece of the grant is caregiver stress, and we will be talking more about that as we roll that piece out as well, because if you don't pay attention to the caregivers, people finish up going to nursing homes. So thank you all very much. And again, I think I've left no time for questions. Okay. Any questions that you desperately have to ask? Uh, primary care people, you should have some thoughts about it. Yeah. No, I agree. The wake, or at least phoning the family and talking to them. I, I had a family member the other day who phoned me to thank me for looking after the person who died, and I, you know, I felt so bad because I hadn't got around to phoning her. You know, so it's really important. Thank you all very much.